closer. I know it feels uncomfortable, but it's... it's Dennis, are you going to start with some instructions? Yeah. So, quick, quick reminder, welcome, thank you for being here. Uh, we'll hear from both uh, County Attorney John Choi and Archbishop Bernard Tepe. Uh, and we have one additional speaker, and then we'll handle questions. If you do me a favor and just tell us when I call you in, say what you need me to do with, and if you have a specific question for someone, great, otherwise we'll just, uh, whoever jumps in first. So let's start with Attorney Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's still morning, so good morning, everybody. Um, it was almost about six years to this day where I was uh, here in this room at this podium uh, declining uh, criminal charges against the Archdiocese for failure to report uh, an instance of child sex abuse. We said when we declined those charges uh, almost a year ago to tomorrow that this was not the end, but it was only the beginning in our investigation. Six years later, here we are today. And um, that journey for many people up here and the people in my office uh, has been a long one with a lot of hard work and some really dedicated uh, work done by many of the attorneys in this office. I want to thank some of those attorneys who uh, started on this journey with us to ultimately get to the truth. Uh, John Kelly, Rick Dusterhoff, Jill Gerber, and of course Stephanie Wiersma, Tom Ring, our investigator Gino uh, Leatherman, and our criminal analyst um, Brielle Bernardi who uh, were critical uh, in that investigation phase of what we were doing, because after we had declined those charges, our work continued to ultimately to get to the truth. And we reviewed hundreds of thousands of pages of documents to understand uh, the full complexity of what the Archdiocese had been failing to do over the course of many, many years. And so it was very much a long journey. That investigation took 20, year, uh, 20 months. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, on June 5th of uh, 2015, uh, we brought forward uh, criminal and civil charges against the Archdiocese alleging their failure to protect children. Um, those children um, belong to uh, just a really amazing family and they're here today. Uh, Joy Hoffman and her boys, Ben, Luke, and Stephen. I, uh, I have gotten to know uh, this family, and I'm just inspired uh, by the, um, the journey that they have been on and, and where, where they were. And I want to tell everybody, in case anybody doesn't understand, uh, the harm that uh, sexual violence does to a human being. Um, the things that happened to this family were unimaginable. I remember first meeting Joy, and I could tell you were physically not well. And it's had such a huge impact. It broke my heart uh, to see all of that. Um, and so I, I want to say to the Hoffman family that it's, um, uh, and I think this is a really important point that was acknowledged by the Archdiocese, but it was not only Curtis Waymeyer that hurt your family, but it was the Archdiocese as well. And with that acknowledgement, I think we've been able to undertake some really important healing as a part of your journey. And it's been my greatest honor uh, to be along with you in that, to help your family find justice, uh, to hold, to ensure that the Archdiocese was held to account, and then to help everybody in this community, your family, the Archdiocese and the Catholic faithful in our community at large uh, to begin a really important journey uh, toward healing and restoration. Um, when we entered into this litigation, ultimately our goals uh, were to do just that, to, assert, to, ass to ensure that we had accountability, to have justice for the victims in our community, and then most importantly, because I think this is what matters about 
moving forward is that this never happens again to anyone. And I know that uh, uh, Joy and your boys, uh, you don't want that ever, ever to happen again. And so that's what we have been working on to create the system and the structure to be put in place and then to move forward from there to change that culture. And so this was a long process where we've had 49 months of civil oversight working uh, at first in an adversarial way, but then collaboratively with the archdiocese because it would be in our interest to ensure that the archdiocese would be successful moving forward. And so over this 49 past months, um, we have been working closely uh, uh, with the archdiocese under Archbishop Hebda's uh, leadership and then also with Tim O'Malley and Janelle Rasmussen. Uh, I want to thank uh, the both of the three of you um, for all of your commitment. I have absolutely, um, I have the greatest confidence in these individuals uh, in their unwavering commitment to ensure that these changes that we are seeing uh, will be everlasting. And of course, we can't guarantee that nothing bad will happen in the future, but I know that as long as uh, these three people are involved with the archdiocese and with more involvement from laity, that I know that we're on the right path. And of course, I, and I think it was said in court today um, in our cultural assessment, Tom Ring did an interview with some, uh, somebody and they said that we'll know if we're really successful maybe five years after Archbishop uh, Hebda's successor. Uh, but that's what we're trying to aim for is that long lasting cultural change. And over the course of this past 49 months, we have seen uh, the Archdiocese really undertake and embrace restorative justice uh, as a value and a principle in terms of what they do. So they've embarked on number, a number of uh, restorative justice sessions within parishes. And these conversations are so critical and important for victims to be able to have a space where they can talk about their abuse and they can have a forum, not only with the Archbishop, but also with uh, other people who have influence uh, within uh, the Archdiocese. Uh, today, the eighth and final progress report uh, was filed today in court and that was accepted by the court. We've had three outside audits and while it was not required on the part of our office, we undertook a very intensive uh, qualitative cultural review or assessment of uh, the archdiocese and it wasn't just a few interviews, it was actually um, more than 50 interviews of many people who would be in the archdiocese to understand whether or not uh, things have actually changed. And that report will be made uh, public at the conclusion of this uh, press conference and it will be available online. And there's a number of uh, uh, interviews that are summarized in there, but more importantly, and I hope this community will pay attention to the recommendations, I know that the archdiocese certainly will, uh, the recommendations that we make about moving forward. And again, I have the greatest confidence uh, that as the Archdiocese moves forward without civil oversight, uh, that they're on the right path as they uh, move forward. And again, I want to reiterate, um, and we all believe this, um, this is like a marathon without a finish line. The work just continues to occur, that needs to occur. And certainly the Archdiocese has uh, gone well beyond the, uh, the actual terms of the settlement agreement, and they have very much embraced and gone beyond what the spirit of this is all about. Um, I want to also remind uh, people that at one point in our history, uh, we were told after the 2002 Dallas Charter that everything was fine in this community. And at that time, I believe that a lot of those statements were window dressing. Today, I want to tell you that I believe that the Archdiocese, under its current leadership, is really committed to that deep systemic and cultural change that they have embedded throughout their organization that is reflected in our cultural assessment. And of course, um, it's not just upon these three people. I think that was one of the mistakes uh, that we made in the past, where we said that, well, somebody is in charge of a particular office and they'll handle everything and everything will be fine and we don't have to think about it again. 
Well, the truth is, and a big part of what we're trying to accomplish, what we tried to accomplish with the settlement agreement, is to ensure that the systems that are in place within the archdiocese ensured that the laity, the Catholic faithful, non-clerics were very involved in these decisions about what to do when uh, a priest uh, misbehaved in a certain way that all of this information would get to a ministerial review board, uh, a group comprised mainly, mostly of uh, laity, not uh, those uh, who are priests. And I think that fundamental change is a really critical one as we think about our future to ensure that uh, everybody in the church recognizes that they have an important role to play to ensure that the protection of children is of paramount importance, more important than anything else. I want to, as I conclude, um, recognize um, some people that are here. First, um, uh, Frank Mears, who is here today uh, from the local SNAP organization. It's been my honor to get to know you, and I think this is a really important moment uh, to see that you are here in support of uh, this movement moving forward and, and will be a part of all of these processes. And I know that you will be there to hold everybody accountable, and you do that very, very well. Uh, but I think it says a lot um, that here in this community uh, that the local leader of SNAP uh, is here today working collaboratively with the Archdiocese that doesn't happen anywhere else in the country. I also want to recognize uh, Patty Wetterling, uh, who is here today, who is a member of the Ministerial Review Board. And Patty, I want to thank you for um, answering that call to be a part of this, because um, you have had a huge and long career in the protection of children. And uh, your voice, uh, I felt, would be needed on that board, and I want to thank you for your uh, commitment to being a part of this process. And Patty isn't Catholic, uh, but she believes in the protection of children and wants to have institutions be successful, and so I just very much appreciate that. I also want to um, thank, um, again, the Archdiocese. Uh, we have Archbishop Pebda, Tim O'Malley, and Janelle Rasmussen up here, but also a special thank you um, uh, to Joe Dixon, uh, who uh, was the attorney who represented the Archdiocese, who vigorously represented the Archdiocese, but I appreciated uh, all of his work and his diligence uh, and also his creativity in helping us come to um, a better path forward. Um, I also want to thank uh, Bishop Cousins, who is in the back. Um, uh, after all of this happened on June 5th, uh, Bishop Cousins was the person that kind of had to take the leadership uh, until Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Hepta came on board. And I just appreciate the early uh, leadership that you exhibited as a part of um, our response. Well, thank you so much. Um, so, and then, of course, uh, to Judge Warner as well, who I'd mentioned in court, I want to thank her for her uh, dedication, diligence, and uh, her leadership as a person who was in charge of overseeing uh, this process. And this process was very unique. It's something that we had never, ever done before. So it took um, special creativity on her part uh, to allow for it and then to also oversee uh, this particular process. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Archbishop Hebda for a few remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I stand here today sorry, sorry, grateful, and humbled. I am sorry the Hoffman family has had to endure so much hurt and pain. I have said it before, but it bears repeating, we failed you. The archdiocese that I lead and love, the archdiocese that you trusted, failed to protect you in a way that has had a huge impact on your lives. I will always be sorry for the harm caused to your family and loved ones, to other victim survivors, and indeed to this community. To the Hoffman family, I am also grateful Grateful that you reported the abuse perpetrated on you. Your courage when this happened and now inspires me and those with whom I work. 
I am confident you have helped others come forward. I am also grateful to you and other survivors who have reached out and met with me. What you have shared during our time together has changed me. You have helped me be a better priest, a better bishop, and a better, more understanding human being. Additionally, I need to express my gratitude to your family for continuing to help me and others work more effectively with the many in our church and community who have been harmed. I am humbled by knowing that without the courage of the Hoffman family and so many others who persisted to hold us accountable, we would not be here today. Able to stand with Ramsey County Attorney John Choi and his team and talk about the promises kept, the progress made, and how we can move forward together so that our churches, schools, and communities are safe. One thing that we have learned through this experience is that addressing sexual abuse in our church is a duty that will never cease. We have learned that vigilant protection, prevention, is never a distraction from the work of the church. Rather, it is intimately related to the work of the church, which is preaching the gospel and manifesting God's love in the world. We cannot do one effectively without the other. How can we be faithful to the one who said, let the little children come to me, if we are not committed to protecting those who are vulnerable and seeking his healing for those who have been harmed? The conclusion of this period of intense oversight by the Ramsey County Attorney's Office is a time for neither celebration nor relief. This is certainly not a time to relax, quite the opposite. Hard, persistent work to maintain vigilance across the 12 counties of the archdiocese must continue. We must honor the common request of nearly every victim survivor that I have encountered. Do everything you can to make sure this never happens to another child. To keep that promise, I pledge to build on our relationship with the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. We value and respect County Attorney Choi and his team for their commitment to keeping our communities safe. I will always be grateful for their role in assisting the Archdiocese in pursuing its goal of effective cultural change. Indeed, we have gratefully learned from Judge Warner and Ramsey County Attorney's Office that the work of creating safe environments is so important that it is far beyond the work of any one bishop or individual. I can assure you, Mr. Choi, and the people of this community, that I will continue to collaborate with those who can make a difference. I think about lay women and men who have come forward to help us and who know all too well the effects of abuse. Extraordinary individuals like the Hoffman family, like Patty Wetterling, Dr. Jim Richter, the latter who both served so generously on our ministerial review board. I look forward to working more closely with a growing number of abuse survivors, like Frank Ewers, and others who have offered to share their experiences and their expertise, helping us create safer environments and building better relationships with our sisters and brothers who have been harmed by individuals in the church. I welcome as well the continued insights and accountability offered by the laity who serve on our review, review board, as well as by the members of our newly constituted Archdiocesan Corporate Board that was undeniably strengthened by the settlement agreement. I will be counting as well on the members of our new lay advisory board and on thousands of employees and volunteers who serve in parishes and schools throughout this archdiocese along with Bishop Andrew Cousins, our many faithful clergy, and our committed lay staff, these women and men will continue to be vitally important as they provide feedback, overview, and recommendations based on their vast experience 
and expertise. Drawing on their input and grateful for their help, I was uh, pleased that the Archdiocese was able to submit to the court this morning its safe environment plan for moving forward. I trust that the faithful of the Archdiocese and the citizens of this community will hold us to that commitment. I am confident that with their help, your help, our church can and will do better. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, I would like to invite uh, Joy Hoffman to come to the podium. I would like to acknowledge the Ramsey County Attorney's Office, John Choi, Tom Ring, Stephanie Wiersma, as well as Archbishop Hebda, Bishop Cousins, Bishop-elect Donald DeGrood, Tim O'Malley, and the Office of Ministerial Standards and Safe Environment for all the work they have done. I would also like to thank Judge Warner, and I would also like to thank and acknowledge the courage, the perseverance of my sons, Benedict, Luke, and Stephen, for persevering to see that justice is done. And I think it has brought us a sense, an instance of healing, a sense of hope, and an assurance that nothing like this will ever happen again. and that we have safety in our parish communities. Thank you all. Okay, imagine there's some questions. Um, I think I know where they want. Kevin, I'll start with you. John, this behavior within the Catholic Church dates back at least 10 centuries. Is 49 months enough? Well, I think the the law can only allow for so much, you know, in terms of civil oversight. I think uh, we've developed a model where civil oversight can play an important role to help an archdiocese um, reckon with its past, to acknowledge harm, and to start having restorative conversations within their parishes and archdioceses and to get them on the path of creating systemic change. That's the model that is here. You can't have um, civil oversight that would go indefinitely. That just would not be appropriate too because we also believe as a value in our country about the separation of church and state. And the church needs to be able to be able to do those things on its own. And again, like I said before, the protection of children I believe is paramount in this archdiocese, and that's the path that they're on. Derek, Archbishop, I'd like to get your thoughts. In court today, the county attorney's office said children are safer now than they were 40 years ago. I'd like to get your thoughts on that statement and, and, and for parents listening. Yes, I, I certainly believe that's true because of the commitment of, of so many. That's certainly a, a desire of mine, um, but it's only uh, realized uh, because so many people, whether it be on our staff or people in the community or the volunteers who uh, go through all of the background checks that we, re we require now, or all of the parish employees who, who now see that as part of their life, are really committed to this as well. So uh, I, I hope that you will uh, take the time to look at the cultural assessment that the Ramsey County Attorney's Office uh, prepared. It speaks to how it is that this is a priority that's shared uh, not just but me, but uh, not just by me, but across our uh, our church and our community. So I, I I'm, I'm delighted that the, the Ramsey County Attorney's Office has found progress in that area, as did Judge Warner, and I certainly am committed that 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 uh, improvement would be something that continues. Yeah. Um, thank you, Um, 
Well, I think we've addressed this uh, in the past before as it relates to things that we could do within the justice system. We are limited by statutes of limitation and we are also limited by uh, our standards for prosecution in terms of whether or not we believe we could prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, someone's guilt. In this particular case involving the Hoffman family, uh, Father McDonough had a limited role in the actual involvement with this particular case and we felt that at the end of the day, um, the and this was a very novel approach, but we wanted to focus on the Archdiocese as a corporation and by doing that, um, that was a strategic decision in and of itself because no one person could then point to somebody else and said, uh, you know, I wasn't aware of that or it was somebody else's responsibility. And it was through that in terms of prosecuting and suing the Archdiocese as a corporation that I believe that we were able to um, get more deeper systemic and cultural change, which was ultimately what was necessary in this case. Because keep in mind that the prosecution of one particular individual or had we proceeded on with the prosecution of the archdiocese, at the most it would have been a gross misdemeanor offense. And so the structural change and the things that could accompany uh, some broader uh, type of um, arrangement like the settlement agreement uh, could not really have been accomplished. And so I feel that ultimately um, uh, in terms of how uh, we dealt with the issue of how we would actually create with systemic change could not have happened really if we were focused on a particular individual as well. Yes. Um, I actually could probably call on Tim O'Malley to give you uh, more of the details, but it really is in, in the area of culture change that we see the, the greatest uh, impact. But even because many of the um, requirements were actually here before I, I, I arrived, but they had just been uh, enacted. But what we see is that there's a real seriousness uh, to enforcing those things. So, for example, we require all of our priests to satisfy three basic requirements that we call the E3. And, and um, uh, Tim and Janelle could speak of how it is that uh, those times, and it's every three years that a, a priest has to renew that. And so if uh, we get to that point where a, a priest has not renewed that and would not be in compliance, we've had to tell them that they're not allowed to minister. That's, that's a game changer. So we, we've been able to, uh, to demonstrate um, that, that we're really serious about this, and I think that's helped with the cultural change as well. We also, uh, in, in this time, we continue to uh, improve our review board in terms of the, uh, the skills of those who have uh, been brought into that work. They're tremendous, they're incredibly generous uh, with their time. I know they have a very careful eye and they uh, certainly have the protection of children as their first priority. But one other area where we've seen a real change, especially in, I would say, in the last three years, two years for sure, is the involvement of uh, a good number of uh, victim survivors who have offered to assist the archdiocese in, 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 in not only creating policies, but also in making sure that we're moving in the right direction. So in, in my mind, that's been a, a, a great place for, uh, for change. I also mentioned changes in our uh, corporate board and where um, those who have uh, uh, take on that um, responsibility and perhaps the, being a member of the corporate board before was seen as a privilege, now it's seen as a pretty weighty responsibility. But it's, it's making sure that uh, those who uh, are responsible, like me, that we're held accountable for our actions. So I think in each of those areas, we see significant uh, improvement uh, that promises as well uh, a c continued Im improvement as well.
So the, the Ministerial Review Board, um, prior to the settlement agreement, um, the way it had operated for a very long time is that the board existed, but it was really up to one particular individual uh, who would be reporting to the archbishop about whether or not they wished to present something to the MRB. And so there was a lot of picking and choosing, right? Here, there's a systemic way by which th those types of instances, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of those serious uh, instances are all going to be in front of the MRB. And then the MRB, we're making sure that we have the right people in place who are actually serving on that ministerial review board. So that was as a related to our oversight, making sure that that happened, that those changes were occurring. I can tell you that today, and you can certainly talk to Patty Wetterling, who serves on that board, um, that is happening. Now, as we step away, um, and the promises that are being made today, certainly uh, by the Archbishop, is to continue that, because I think that is uh, very much a critical piece of all of this, uh, that we have a, a robust MRB board that is reviewing all of the allegations of misconduct, and that they're making uh, the, in that, in that board, which is comprised mostly of lay people, would be making a recommendation to the Archbishop. And from what I understand of the MRB's proceedings during the term of the settlement agreement, the Archbishop has taken all of the recommendations about each individual case that was presented to the MRB. So I think that in and of itself is very significant uh, because Archbishop Hebda believes in that process because he's a part of creating it. Talk, this could be for both of you, how much of the reforms that have taken place during this process do you believe are a model for other archdioceses across the country? Yes. So we, we hate to set ourselves up as a target either. Mm -hmm. huh? And uh, one of the things that we've uh, mentioned in, in our work so, for, so far is that we realize there's a lot of improvement that goes on too. So we certainly are, are willing to share uh, the work that has been done. And there was a restorative justice um, conference here on Thursday that had people from across the country that were able to hear a little bit about how we've been using that as a tool for some uh, healing in our archdiocese. But we also realize that there are other dioceses that uh, have excellent programs in other areas that we continue to, to look at as well. We know that we want to improve our outreach to those who have been harmed, for example. So uh, we certainly, uh, we're, I'm grateful. I, I can't imagine um, that there's another archdiocese that has a staff like mine, um, really, and, uh, or, or a, 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 a laity in the archdiocese who are so involved in this area. Uh, but I know that we certainly, so we're willing to share what it is that we have, but we also know that we have a lot to learn. If I could add just one point on that last question as well with the, Ministerial Review Board. And um, as was mentioned, I, I've accepted 100% of the recommendations that have come to me. The, the system is set up so the buck still does stop here. <laughs> but one of the things that's great is I know that the members of my review board aren't shrinking wallflowers. <laughs> if, if I was not being responsive uh, to the hard work that they're, that they're doing, they'd quit. <laughs> they'd let you know of that as well. And I'm counting on that uh, going forward. We also, uh, in terms of changing some structures, so uh, and, uh, County Attorney Choi had mentioned sometimes there might be some selectivity in deciding what goes to a review board. Um, one of the ways in which things have been changed as well is that uh, Tim O'Malley, who's our director of the Office for Ministerial Standards, is also obligated to go over all of these things with a risk committee of our corporate board. So it, they're going to be making sure as well that every item that comes to our attention is, is handled appropriately. So there, we're looking for all of those uh, checks and balances as well uh, to make sure that we're doing the, the best work that we can. Great, well I think uh, that might be a natural stopping point for this portion. I know there are individuals who will stick around for additional questions if we have those. Um, one thing I will point out that the envelope we're gonna send out uh, relatively soon 
by email is I think we have some hard copies to share with you of our assessment reports. If you want to walk away with that, knowing you'll get the, you know, the link later on, but if you want to walk away with something uh, as you leave, that's, that's fine with us as well. So thanks very much for everyone, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you.